This is a momentous week. First, the US election, now a power play that's at least as important. The confirmation of the Chinese elite who will steer the country through the next decade. We assess the extent and the limits of the change in the next 10 years. China will evolve its own type of democracy, whether the West accepts it or not. And America and China are tied together in a tight economic embrace and they are the two mightiest nations in the world will one squeeze the breath out of the other. Now the campaign is over, the president has to return to the practical realities of dealing with China. We speak to Henry Kissinger, the architect of US-China relations, in his first television interview since President Obama was re-elected. We'll be discussing China's future path with a leading Chinese author and activist, a political theorist who's a professor in universities in Beijing and Shanghai, and the American political scientist who wrote The J-Curve. Also tonight, the Prime Minister issues this warning about trial by Twitter. This is really important, right, because there is a danger, if we're not careful, that this could turn into a sort of, uh, a sort of witch hunt, particularly against people who uh, are gay. Are some politicians being unfairly hounded by social media? Good evening. The leadership of the world's second largest economy is being replaced according to plan. But the incoming president and his gang of six will come under increasing internal and external pressure in its decade of power. As Hu Jintao hangs over to Xi Jinping at the end of the Communist Party's 18th National Congress, the clamor in the country over corruption among the elite is ever louder. The demand for social change, health care and pensions stronger. The need to, to move millions from the country to the city more intense. Anger at the surveillance state louder. Hu Jintao has already said there'll be no Western-style democracy, but how much will global media fuel continued protest? Here's our economics editor, Paul Mason. There is theatre, spectacle, but no drama. Improvisation is not encouraged, nor indeed expression, nor indeed voting against. The script at the party congress is simple, the handover of leadership from one generation to the next. The outgoing man, Hu Jintao, leaving them with a stark warning. Combating corruption and promoting political integrity is a clear-cut and long-term political commitment of the party. If we fail to handle this issue well, it could prove fatal to the party and even cause the collapse of the party and the fall of the state. Recent events have shown the order is fragile. Bo Xi Lai, until this year the third most powerful man in China, was disgraced after his wife was convicted of murdering a British businessman. After Bo, what the leadership desires now is calm. The one thing that, that you can say about China is that after the Cultural Revolution, their senior leadership decided that they needed consensus and that they didn't want any radical departures in policy. And I think one of the reasons that Bo Zhilai, the former party chief in Chongqing, was purged was that he wasn't that kind of leader. He was charismatic, he had a lot of really different policies, and I think he threatened to upset that balance. And so I think what we do know is that there will be a lot of continuity. The Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989 was the product of a split within the party between reformers and hardliners. The leadership vowed never again to let the debate on political and economic change spill out onto the streets. Instead, it takes place between two unacknowledged factions at the highest level. The incoming Politburo Standing Committee falls into two camps, one loyal to former leader Jiang Zemin and another group aligned with current leader Hu Jintao. 
The Jiang group built careers in the fast-growing coastal provinces. They stand against democratic reform and for a more rapid move to the free market. They are, in this sense, the most capitalist communists in China. The group around Hu came up within the party's youth league. Their slogan, Promote Social Harmony, is code for delivering tolerable lifestyles to workers and peasants and alleviating social conflict. The new leader, Xi Jinping, comes from the Jiang faction. So who is he? He experienced a lot of hardship. He went to the countryside at the age of 15 and spent seven years in the backwater regions of China and then started working at every level of the Chinese government until now. Yeah. Zhang Weiwei is a Shanghai academic whose best-selling book is said to have influenced the new leader. He has a personality. Yeah, this is very important. And uh, often uh, he can speak his mind openly. And uh, so, so he has his own style. What yeah. will he do differently to Hu Jintao? I think uh, he said many times, uh, whenever he takes up a new position, he tried to see what his predecessors has done. And he wants to maintain certain coherence and continuity. But the party can't afford just continuity. Outside the Great Hall of the People, this brief and stifled protest, just a small echo of the problems China faces. The middle class wants a bigger slice of the pie. The internet is awash with grievance, the environment under severe strain. Xi Jinping, with strong links to the military, could be the man to advance where his predecessor could not go, towards more democracy within the party and more political freedom. But will he? Understanding what they're trying to say at this Congress is not easy. Take this. The Political Bureau has comprehensively pushed forward the socialist, economic, political, cultural, social and conservation culture construction with various causes achieving remarkable results. It's impervious to logic. How would you argue it wasn't remarkable or comprehensive? And what causes? But the subtext to all this is clear. The Chinese leadership has seen the Arab Spring and is terrified of a Chinese Spring. Chinese public intellectuals now talk about uh, how to prevent uh, a revolution and people compare uh, that uh, uh, the French Revolution you know, many, many years ago uh, saying that, uh, that uh, uh, you need to sometimes regime start to uh, change as, uh, 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 that actually uh, or start to reform, political reform. This is the most dangerous period for a revolution. Now, of course, some conservatives also like this young argument. <laughs> Facing strikes and disturbances always heavily repressed, the leadership in September provoked its own disturbances. Picking a fight with Japan over disputed islands and allowing large street demonstrations to close down Japanese factories. There's much to the islands dispute that is, again, theatre, but it's left the West and China's neighbours wondering where things go next. Well, the outgoing leader dropped a heavy hint today. We should enhance the capability to accomplish a wide range of military tasks, the most important of which is to have the ability to win local wars in an information age. Last year, President Obama authorized a major redeployment by the U.S. military to Asia. Known as the Pivot, it involves moving 9,000 U.S. Marines from Japan to Guam, Australia and Hawaii, together with strategic missile systems. Putting four high-tech combat ships into the vital trade lane of Singapore, moving a fifth of the Navy ships currently in the Atlantic to the Pacific, including a possible aircraft carrier to Australia, and there's talk of moving some of the troops in Afghanistan to the Philippines. The American pivot was really the most important thing that the Obama administration did, and I think it was utterly amazing that in none of the debates was there any discussion about its appropriateness or what its future ought to be. Uh, I think that since the financial crisis of uh, four years ago, uh, the Chinese have been much more assertive in foreign policy and particularly in these territorial disputes in the South China Sea and they've been saying some pretty outrageous things uh, about um, 
Uh, for example, the fact that none of the states uh, uh, in that area can talk to each other about how to deal with a rising China. They all have to simply deal with China bilaterally. On the eve of the Congress, an influential party theorist warned that America's real threat to China lay in its encouragement of rights lawyers, underground religious activists, dissidents, internet leaders and vulnerable groups as core constituencies with the aim of infiltrating China's grassroots. When this list was published, there was outrage because of the overtones with Mao-era witch hunts. But those close to the leadership say there's no problem of democratic accountability at all. China will evolve its own type of democracy, whether the West accept it or not. Uh, I described it as a selection plus some kind of election. Over the past 2,200 years since China's first unification in 221 BC, China was run by a one-party political structure. At the top level, it's always a unified Confucian state. Without this kind of structure, the country disintegrate. And uh, so if you check with uh, Chinese, what's the greatest fear in your life? They will tell you, Luan, which means chaos. And right on cue, the past master of dealing with chaos was brought out today. Jiang Zemin himself, 86 years old, the living symbol of political repression, was given centre stage. On a day of heavy symbolism, it left many Chinese people thinking, back to the future. Paul Mason, well, the BBC's World Affairs editor John Simpson is in Beijing and joins me now. Uh, John, uh, we've heard there uh, the idea that there'll be maintain the maintaining of continuity uh, with the new Premier, but what do you think his rule will be like? Well, um, let me just say, first of all, Kirsty, that I, I was struck tremendously uh, by when I was in the Great Hall of the People this morning by the similarities with going to those big congresses that the Soviet uh, Communist Party used to hold back in 1987, 1988 uh, and 1989 when it was trying to work out how to change where it was going to go to. Now there's lots of differences, major differences. I mean no Gorbachev figure of course here uh, nevertheless, that sense of, of change just kind of bubbling up all round and yet nobody knowing how to harness it, uh, where it's going to take them, uh, was, was really very strong indeed. So I think, I mean, this new leadership is nothing very much more than a kind of extension of the previous one. Uh, everybody knows it's got to do things and it's got to do things fairly radically and everybody thinks it's not really going to be up to the job of doing anything very radical. I mean, it was pretty amazing, really, to listen to President Hu going on about the need, urgent need to do something about corruption. Well, this is right at the end of 10 years of his rule. Why didn't he do anything about it? He's talked about it plenty of times before. Uh, it's, it, it, you just have the sense of a, of a party system which is faced with, with huge problems as well as huge successes and doesn't really know quite what to do and so just kind of goes on walking along in the same direction in the hope that something will happen. In that case, what do you think will characterize China's relationship uh, with a second term of an Obama administration? It, the attitude towards America is really interesting here and I've watched it change over the years. Uh, the old attitude used to be uh, that of a kind of rather resentful uh, secondary power which felt that it was being held back, it was being unfairly criticized, unfairly attacked and so forth by the United States. Um, that's, that's changed now. After four years of Barack Obama, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, system doesn't really have any great uh, fears about him. 
Um, well, I, I have to say it. I mean, it's not a very nice thing to say, really, in a way. But uh, one uh, figure with very, very strong links to the top party people was saying they think they can push him around quite easily. So it, the, the whole approach has changed towards America. And frankly, it's, it's in this part of the world, in Asia, that uh, at the moment the Chinese see their main area of operations. And we'll be discussing that later. Thank you very much indeed, John. Well, during the American election, both Mitt Romney and Barack Obama leveled varying degrees of criticism at China, particularly over its economic practices, including industrial espionage. China, in turn, railed against what it sees as U.S. protectionism, most recently over solar energy products. But each country is the biggest market for the other's exports, so the two are intricately bound together. So is the idea of any military conflict between the two superpowers unthinkable? And if so, what will be the defining feature of their relationship in the next decade? Here's our diplomatic editor, Mark Urban. I should warn you, this piece contains flash photography. The lesson of history is that weak empires give way to the strong. If Obama would stand up to China, and America's current preoccupation with China has produced these political attack ads, as well as plenty of campaign rhetoric. He said no. They are artificially lowering their prices and killing American jobs. We can't just sit back and let China run all over us. Hey guys. Last night, Barack Obama returned to the White House, having promised to hold China to account for its trading practices. What's he going to do about it now? Those who've been inside the White House policy loop suggest it'll be gentle diplomacy. There's a gap between uh, political campaigning and, and uh, governing. Um, I think that, uh, that some of the tough rhetoric that you heard in the campaign will not translate into policy. I think presidents do have an ability to, uh, to use uh, various tools uh, to, um, to uh, shape policy towards um, China and other countries. Of course, it's not just about trade. There are human rights and security concerns and a worry flagged up by this Republican's campaign commercial. Your economy get very weak. That China is buying up American debt so it can be used as a source of pressure. U.S. diplomats insist that they do still defend their national interests. Currency uh, valuations have been a, uh, a recurring theme during the campaign, and yet quietly uh, the United States has been effective in getting China to, uh, uh, to begin the process of, of, of balancing its currency versus uh, the dollar in a, in a fair manner. Um, are we where we want to be yet? No. Uh, has there been progress on this front? Yes. The arrogant and unsupportable pretensions of China that she will hold commercial intercourse not upon terms of equal reciprocity, but upon the insulting and degrading forms of the relations between Lord and Vassal, so lamented US President John Quincy Adams. That was back in 1841. That's how long Americans have been complaining about their terms of trade with China. These days, though, the public is much more engaged with the issue and gunboat diplomacy being out of the question, the president has to take the US case to international bodies like the World Trade Organization. Richard Nixon defined the modern US relationship with China at a time when it was still largely a peasant economy. That may have changed, but the perception that the relationship is too important to fail remains. You had a Republican president open up that relationship back in 72. You had a Democratic uh, president essentially uh, formalize that relationship. Every president, Democrat or Republican since, uh, has continued to advance the relationship between the United States and China. New, new issues today, new challenges today. But we've never gone backward, we've gone forward. So what to expect? A careful handling of a delicate relationship for sure. But don't be surprised if by 2016, America is even more indebted to China, significant trade issues unresolved, 
and the political ads still running. <laughs> Mark Urban, will we discuss all that because further we're having our first interview with President since President Obama was re-elected. We've got the Nobel Peace Prize winner and former U.S. Secretary of State and National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger joining us now from New York. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I understand that you have met Xi Jinping. Uh, I think actually probably actually more than once. Tell me, what did you make of him? Yes, I've met him several times. And what did you make of him? I mean, we've heard from somebody who knows him well in Beijing that he's a man that wants to steady as you go uh, to make sure that there is a kind of seamless transition. Uh, my impression was that he, uh, he was uh, thoughtful, uh, perhaps a more assertive personality than his immediate predecessor, Hu Jintao, uh, shaped by a different set of experiences uh, in which his uh, uh, experience during the Cultural Revolution uh, plays an important role, and very conscious of the fact that he is stepping into a position at a period of enormous transformations that lie ahead for China and to some extent for the world. What do you think uh, domestically is his biggest issue? Well, as uh, his predecessor pointed out at the end of a 10-year period that uh, corruption is a key issue and a an extension of their def of the definition of of democracy, which has a different content in the mm -hmm. Chinese context as in the American or British one, but nevertheless in, involves a broadening of the base in a, in some manner. Now, both um, Barack Obama and Mitt Romney had quite an aggressive stance towards China in uh, the run-up to the election. Uh, you might have heard our World Affairs course, uh, editor John Simpson say that there's a feeling in China that actually Barack Obama might be able to be pushed around a little bit. What do you make of that? Well, I thought that the I, uh, during the election, I called the... the uh, arguments being made about China on both sides uh, rather deplorable because they were geared entirely to the immediate short-term American domestic politics and were conducted in terms of immediate uh, American situations uh, which were not f always fully relevant to China. But I, I think that both Obama and uh, Xi Jinping uh, will now have to ask themselves how they uh, expect the relationship between the two countries to evolve, where they want to be at the end of, say, a five or uh, maybe ten-year period, uh, and to what extent that relationship can be cooperative, and to what extent it will be uh, adversarial. Uh, both uh, countries impinge on each other in significant ways. But both leaders, and certainly uh, the leaders I know on both sides, know that a military conflict between them would have an outcome comparable to World War I for Europe in which there are no winners. Uh, so that is the fundamental challenge, mm -hmm. that while each side undergoes its domestic challenges, whether they can find a broader framework for the Sino-American uh, relationship, and that can't be determined uh, uh, primarily in terms of the uh, tactical disputes of the last few years. Well, I, I, I was going to ask you briefly on what Hu Jintao said oh, today. And, and can Obama, the question is, can Obama be pushed around easily? Yes, but, but, uh, uh, I, but... I think that is... Uh, uh, I, I don't think that is uh, in the light of its conduct uh, this year. It's not a prospect. It's not a theory on which anybody should act. 
I want to ask you just at this stage briefly, uh, Hu Jintao talked today about being able to manage local territorial battles. Uh, and of course, we've just been talking uh, in Paul Mason's film about the pivot and about moving American capability into the area. Do you think China will push its luck locally? I support the uh, military deployment of the pivot. But I do not believe one should base the relationship between China and the United States uh, uh, primarily uh, or largely on the experience of the Cold War of military, of military confrontations. The historic experience of China has been threats from neighboring countries. And uh, so it is a uh, understandable uh, expression that Hu Jintao used today. Uh, but if the relationship were to degenerate into the management of local military situations, uh, the future of that relationship would be very dire. And both sides, and I repeat, both sides have an obligation uh, to do their utmost to get the relationship on, a, uh, on the basis of a dialogue and of a dialogue about the future and not of the immediate uh, issues that, uh, that lead to, to these, these, these conflicts. Well, Henry, because you do stay with us because I'm going to bring um, other guests into the discussion now to discuss this all further is the Chinese novelist and former business professor, Diane Wei Ling. She grew up in a labor camp in China and joined student democracy protests in Tiananmen Square. She now lives in London. Ian Bremer is visiting the UK but works in the United States where he runs a global political research film firm. And in Paris is the philosophy professor Daniel Bell, who lives and lectures in Beijing and in Shanghai. Uh, Diane, first of all, um, how would you uh, characterize the domestic challenges that Xi Jinping is uh, going to face? Are they going to be ones of uh, you know, freedom and democracy, or are they going to be ones of moving 400 million people from the, city, the country to the cities in the next 10 years? Are they going to be practical problems? Oh, I think he's facing a huge a range of problems, and that includes moving people f from the rural mm. area to the city. Corruption is a major issue, and in his speech, he talked about a lot redistribution of wealth mm -hmm. and a, a range of social issues, and, and also internet. And in his speech, there's a piece about heightening security and safety on the internet so, so it's a conservative message and of course the positioning of Zhang Zemin right in the midst of the committee did that surprise you in some ways it did I think it, and to get taken together with the tone of the speech mm -hmm. which to me is rather conservative I wonder whether it is indication of the composition of the coming standing mm -hmm. committee which as we know would be the seven most mm -hmm. important members that will run the country Ian Bremer, uh, what's your analysis of the makeup, do you think, of the seven? Oh, I, I think we are talking about uh, a very consensus oriented, mm -hmm. risk averse group. Mm -hmm. They feel like the challenges domestically are growing. They know that the challenges internationally are growing. They feel a greater adversarial relationship with the United States, though they don't want one. Do you one. mean in economic terms or do you mean actually even? in geopolitical terms and uh, military terms. Well, I would argue that the geopolitics are increasingly being driven by economics. Yeah. I certainly agree with Dr. Kissinger that nobody wants a military war, but the U.S. and China are at war with each other on the cyber front every day. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's going to get worse, isn't it? Because there already be. have been blockages yes. of telecoms companies working in America. Uh, yeah. Yes, that'll get worse. Uh, but also, uh, when you think about how the China, China is an adversary to the U.S. and a threat, it's really not on the military side, where mm -hmm. America outspends the next 10 economies in the world together on the military but economically China will be the largest economy in the world and American companies increasingly think they don't have access they're losing out to state-owned enterprise uh, Daniel Bell from uh, your position in Paris do you think that uh, America and indeed the West needs to exercise a bit of humility when it comes to China um, obviously we've heard quite a lot of saber rattling during the presidential campaign but do you think there needs to be a recalibration of even the atmosphere between the two well, I think it would help if um, the U.S. and other Western countries recognize that there is an alternative model. We can call it the China model, which we can say is meritocracy at the top, democracy at the bottom, 
and lots of room for experimentation and diversity in between. So why are they raising corruption as such a big issue? Actually, China is not that corrupt if you compare it to countries at a similar level of economic development. Um, but why is it a big issue? Because the political leaders derive legitimacy from being seen as meritocratically selected. That is, they have ability and virtue. And if they're seen to be corrupt, then obviously they lack virtue. And that goes to the very core of the legitimacy of the regime. So yeah. that's why they really have to tackle corruption in a way maybe that countries like India don't have but, to. But, but isn't, you know, isn't one of the major problems you know, in China is that it, you know, the elite, as you say, you know, ha has, has merit. You know, they're, they've got 10 years to do their best for the country. But the problem is, is the lower ranks of officials, the corruption that runs all the way down the food chain that makes people so furious. That's true, but the lower level officials also derive legitimacy from being democratically chosen in local level elections, whereas the top level leaders derive much, if not all, of their legitimacy from being viewed as meritocratically selected. So it's a more serious problem if the top leaders are being but, seen as but, corrupt but than Diane, if the lower leaders are being seen as corrupt. But Diane, we just heard that Hu Jintao had 10 years to sort this out and has, uh, didn't sort it out. So in a sense, is, is the frustration of the people going to become even greater now? Uh, absolutely. And I, I think it, this is we're talking about a system which itself produces the kind of corruption and the, the elite, as we know, and they control a lot of wealth because for a long time you could not do any business without having a member of the elite to be on your mm -hmm. board, etc. And this has become a major issue as we see in the internet, in do, the Dr. demonstration. Dr. Kissinger, do you think this might be the new regime's Achilles heel, that this clamor about corruption and this clamor for social change not necessarily you know western style democracy but social change will really eat in uh, to um, the power and authority of the of, of this this decades regime uh, may i say two things i don't think it is correct to talk about xi jinping as if he has absolute control uh as decisions are made by a kind of consensus of the standing committee of the uh, Politburo, uh, the number is either seven or nine, uh, and so his in the personal freedom of maneuver, uh, of which he is chairman and the most influential member, uh, but his personal freedom is not the same as that of Mao or Deng Zhao, uh, mm -hmm. of of Deng Xiaoping. Uh, uh, yes, I do believe that the issue of corruption has been uh, stated uh, also by the Chinese as, uh, as the, in many ways, the deepest challenge mm -hmm. of the regime. Uh, but then that will involve uh, such a wide range of personalities that the management of, uh, of the uh, improvement of it will require enormous skill. Do you think and this that is why I don't believe that foreign adventures will be the dominant theme no. or a conceivable theme of Chinese foreign policy. Do you agree with that, Ian Bremer? Uh, oh, I don't think they want foreign adventures, uh, but I do think that the necessity of continued Chinese growth means that their actual footprint on the ground in countries around the world, in Africa, in Latin America, Brazil, they're the largest trade partner, across Southeast Asia, will be perceived as a challenge, as a threat. Uh, by many local actors. And furthermore, the most important U.S. ally in the region is Japan. And Japanese companies have made big bets on China, and those CEOs all think they may have made mistakes now. And you've got potential conflict in the East China Sea between Japan and China. And the Japanese aren't defending themselves, the Americans are. If this gets worse, and the Chinese absolutely have been pushing that over the last couple months, the United States are engaged in a conflict they would much rather steer clear of. But how, but how exactly could they be engaged in a conflict when they're so intimately linked economically? I mean, it just seems extraordinary that there are people there doing deals 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Each is the other's greatest export market. And you've got a, a standoff over Japan. Yes, you do. Well, I mean, it's at the same time that the United States uh, has its greatest external debt holder, China. You also have a cyber war going on between these two countries all the time. We're not friends anymore. 
Obama called us adversaries in the third uh, debate, mm -hmm. but actually we're frenemies. And you can have conflict at the same time that you have cooperation. That makes the Japan issue very dangerous indeed. Thank you all very much indeed. The Prime Minister warned against a witch hunt against gay people when he was ambushed on daytime television today with a list of alleged child abusers collated from the internet. This evening, a Tory MP wrote to Ofcom urging them to 